Sunday school class, um, our Bible study class that meets over here at 9 o'clock, um, they discussed my sermon. <laughs> so for those of you that were in the Bible study, this will be a review. If you weren't there, we invite you to come at 9 o'clock on Sunday, and uh, you can pick it up at the end of this sermon, next Sunday. The title of the sermon is, Want to Trade? And it's taken from Genesis 25, verses 27 to 34. I'll let you turn there. Uh, we'll read it in just a minute. Life is a trade-off. Our entire life is a process of trading one thing for another. <clears throat> we all have the same amount of time. We all have different abilities. And we trade this time and these abilities for other things. If you have a job, you go to work and you trade your time and work for money. You go to the store and you pay money to buy food. You make your monthly car payment out of the money that you make from those hours that you gave at work in order to provide transportation and shelter. If you give your love away, you can build a relationship. We trade that love, so to speak, for that relationship. We sacrifice some things in order to be able to relax and rest and have a vacation. And we trade things in order that we can have pleasure in life. But a lot of times, what we find ourselves doing is we're frittering away, wasting away the time that we have on things that are completely unimportant and unnecessary. <clears throat> things that really don't matter. In some cases, we spend our time doing things and engaging in things that not only harm ourselves, but oftentimes harm others as well. Many people trade their, their family time for success in their career. They may be successful, often that comes though at the price of the family. Many times, because of this, they even lose their family in the process. Renee and I were discussing the other day about the number of anniversaries that I missed while I was in the Army. There were lots of of events, life events, that I missed in order that I could serve my country. That was a trade-off. It was done on purpose, by design, so to speak, but it was still a trade-off. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. <coughs> I, uh, the allergies, the pollen is flying and it's, it's getting my allergies. I heard it once said that when a man is on his deathbed, he rarely ever says, though, I wish I'd have spent more time at the office. Right. Right. You never hear that. The regret is, I wish I would have spent more time with my family or doing something else. Some people trade their time for a few minutes of sexual pleasure outside of their marriage and and their lives and their families and their marriages are all casualties as a result 
of this poor exchange. But every day, we trade our lives, our soul, for something. The question is, for what? When everything is said and done, when your life is over, what will you have to show for the time that you were here on this earth? If you traded your time and your ability for things that are temporal to gratify an immediate need, you will have nothing to show for your time and your abilities. You will come up empty-handed. Today's Bible story is about just such a man. Esau's life is the story of a man who traded his birthright for a fleeting pleasure. Look at Genesis 25, verse 27 through 34. <coughs> it says, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Rebekah was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom which means red. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. <clears throat> Esau sold his birthright, which included not only material benefits and family privileges, but spiritual blessings as well. And he traded it all for a bowl of stew. I want you to think about that for a minute. He traded it all for a bowl of stew. And it says that he rose, after he eaten it, it says he rose in verse 34. He said he ate and drank and rose and went his way. He never looked back. He never gave it a second thought. Well, not right then anyway. Later on he did. But he wanted it. He got it. It tasted good. And it was only later that he realized the significance of his foolish actions. Someone once said the difference between school and life is that in school you're taught a lesson and then given a test. In life, you're given a test which teaches you a lesson. Esau's motto in life was, if it feels good, do it. How many people do you know who, have, who share that same motto? Yes. He was a good times guy. He was a live for the moment kind of person. He was a leap before you think kind of man. But listen, living for instant gratification will rob you yes. of spiritual blessings. Always. What was so special about this birthright Anyway, this is not a tradition that we have in our society today. So I think it's important for you to get the significance of this, this idea about the birthright. First of all, it contains a double portion of the father's inheritance. That means if there are two kids or three kids or four kids, that this birthright that comes to the oldest child is that he gets twice as much as every other child gets. In Deuteronomy 21, 17, it says this, but he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the firstfruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So Esau had the right of the firstborn. 
He was to get a double portion of all that his father had. Not only that, but it offered rule and authority over the other members of the family. Genesis 27 and 29 says, Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be any, everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. You see, by giving up this birthright, he gave up the ability to rule and have authority over his other brother. He also, this birthright also gave him the right to become the patriarch and priest of the house the moment that his father died. He became the chief of the chosen family and the heir of the promise of blessings that was given to his father and his forefathers before him by God. And he was also, because of this birthright, he was able to invoke the blessing of Abraham regarding the threefold promise. Genesis 28, 4 says this, May he, that is God, give the blessing of Abraham to you, and here it is, and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. And in Genesis 12, 1 through, or Genesis 12, 1 through 3, this is, what, it, this is what, he, what God told Abraham. He says, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And here it is. One, I will make of you a great nation. And two, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And, and three, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in, in, and in you all of the families of earth shall be blessed. Do you see the significance of this birthright for Esau? And he was willing to trade it for some lentil stew and a slice of bread. There are four lessons I believe that we can learn from this story. And I want us to, to look at these today. Lesson one is this. You will lose great blessings if you do not appreciate them. You will lose great blessings if you do not appreciate them. <clears throat> we need to learn to stop and smell the roses. We just made a journey this week to Savannah, Georgia for the birth of my grandson. And I will tell you that, that my goal as I made my way to Savannah was to get there because we knew that our daughter was going to have a baby very soon. We didn't know exactly how soon. As it turned out, it was about five days after we got there. But we knew that it was going to be soon, and so we were making our way there. And, and, and what I discovered was that I really was focused on getting to the destination, so much so that I didn't even look around to enjoy the view. I will tell you that on the way back, there wasn't much to look at, except a lot of cars in Atlanta, Georgia. I am telling you, you could not pay me enough money. There's not enough money on this earth to pay me to live in Atlanta, unless I could have my own helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> and I could fly over that traffic. That was berserk. But I will tell you that, that, that so often, that's it. We get so focused on the destination that we forget to enjoy the journey. There's a, a wonderful old hymn, Count Your Blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. You know, so often we take the things that God has given to us for granted. And yet, if you have a salary, and you have a nice place to live in, and you have a car to drive, you are richer than 87% of the world's population. I want you to think about that for a minute. And so often we complain about the things that we don't have instead of being grateful for the things that God has given us. And I believe that if, if, we, if, if we do not appreciate the things that God has given us, 
that we're going to lose out on those blessings. Instead of craving the things we don't have, appreciate the things we do have. I, I, I'm not real big into poetry, but I, I read this poem the other day, and it really, it really spoke to me, and I want to read it to you. It's called Present Tense by Jason Lehman. It says, it was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall that I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood that I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted, to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 that I wanted. <laughs> The youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age that I wanted. The presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, and I never got what I wanted. Think about that. Esau could only see his immediate need. And he wanted to gratify that immediate need at any price. Brothers and sisters, don't trade your tomorrows for a momentary pleasure. When I was in the Army as a chaplain, one of the things that, that, I, that I had to deal with was soldiers who were feeling like life held no hope for them. <clears throat> and for them, oftentimes, the solution was a permanent solution to a temporary problem. I recall one time when I was stationed at Fort Leavenworth that a, that a, a, a young specialist came into my office um, and, and she began to talk and kind of share her story with me. And it became obvious to me that she held no hope for her life. And so I asked her the hard question. I don't think she expected me to say it, but I asked her the hard question. Have you thought about killing yourself? She kind of looked surprised. She had this look of surprise on her face. She said, well, actually, I have. And I said, when was the last time you had those thoughts? And she said, this morning. And I said, do you have a plan for how you're going to do this? And she opened her purse and she pulled out a bottle of sleeping pills. And I realized that this was a moment of crisis in her life. The good news is that she did not commit suicide. The good news is, is that I was able to share the love of Christ with her. And instead of killing herself, she gave her life to Christ. But so often we see this, this permanent solution to temporary problems. And we're willing to trade all of our tomorrows just to get rid of the pain that we're experiencing today. Lesson two. Small choices can have drastic consequences. Sometimes we make choices without thinking. They seem inconsequential, but they turn out to be very costly. How many of you, I've asked you this before, but how many of you, by show of hands, how many of you have ever thought or said, boy, if I had to do that over again, I'd sure do it differently? Raise your hand. Come on, everybody. Raise your hand. We've all been there. We've all done something stupid. And it was just because we just didn't think and we did something stupid. I could go into detail about some of the stupid things that I've done because I didn't think. I just spoke without thinking. Uh, I've mentioned those before. I don't need to dwell on that. But I will tell you that that, 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 is, a, that is a real 
situation in many people's lives. I spent some time as a chaplain in the United States Disciplinary Barracks, the maximum security prison run by the Department of Defense. And most of the people that were in there, more than half of the people that were in there, were not there because they had a life of crime. Most of the people were there because they made one foolish, unthinking decision that cost them their entire, the rest of their life. Hebrews 12, 15 to 17 says this. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. There is no one sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Brothers and sisters, our decisions have consequences. Make sure that you're making the right choice every single day. Because all of your tomorrows hang in the balance of the decisions that you make today. Lesson number three. It's easy to mistake a want with a need. This is a big one. Listen, we're, we're bombarded with advertisements everywhere we go. And now they've figured out billboards aren't good enough. Now they've, they've made them electronic so that as you're driving down the road, you don't see one, but you see three or four of them in a row. They figured this out. It's on your television. It's on your iPad. You download an app and you don't want to pay for it, so you get a free app, but there's advertisements on it. And how many of you have clicked on those advertisements? They know that you're going to do it. That's why they pay for the game for you to have free. But we're bombarded by these advertisements, and, and, it, and, it, and it confuses us because we mistake a want for a need. I, I need to have that. When in fact, what you really mean is, I want that. I can tell you that I have never made a bad decision about that. But if I told you that, I'd be lying. <laughs> Let me talk about when we were young. Can I just say two words, Renee? Teeny, genie. You all are going, what in the world is that? Yeah. We were walking in the mall one day in Columbus, Georgia. And we passed by a... Wurlitzer of Baldwin, Oregon store that was in the mall. I don't think they have those anymore, but they did back then. <coughs> and so we walked in. Renee played the piano. I played at the piano. I'm, I'm not very good at it. She's, she's much better than I. We walked in, and we started looking around. And before we knew it, we had purchased something called a teeny genie. It was just a miniature organ that we had in our living room. And how many easy payments was it? Too many to think about. OK? And we got home, and we both looked at each other after a few days, and we go, what did we do? <laughs> we don't want this in our house. We don't need this, but we kept, how many years did we have that thing? Uh, a year? Yeah, 12. It took us five years to pay for it. took us five years to pay for that stinking thing. I mean, it was cute. It was nice because it was a novelty, and when people come over, we could show them some neat stuff. But we didn't need that. But we saw that as a need instead of a want. Let me go a little further. We were stationed in Germany, and a guy knocks on the door about 8 o'clock at night and I, at our apartment in the, on the economy. And I open the door and he says, would you like, I forgot how he asked me. He says, would you be interested in, in, in considering purchasing a set of encyclopedias? And I said, no. And I started to close the door and he said, well, how do you know? You don't even know what I'm selling yet. And so he came in. <laughs> How many years did we have American Educator Encyclopedia? I do remember that when my son, who was born while we were in Germany, 
was in school and he needed to do a school project, he cut pictures out of the encyclopedia and pasted them onto posters to take to school. I would go look up something and there'd be holes in the encyclopedia. But you know what, folks? That was before the internet. But we didn't need American educators' encyclopedias. But the guy convinced us that we needed them. And so we bought them. <laughs> yeah, Renee, Renee clarified. The, the disclaimer is he convinced me, not her. Okay? <clears throat> I don't know if you watch television, but I, I need to ask you a question. What's with these Hardee's commercials? Come on, you know what I'm talking about, guys. What does a lady that it has hardly no clothes on lying on a beach got to do with a hamburger? Okay, but you look at that commercial and all of a sudden you feel like you've got to have a hamburger because if you have that hamburger, probably there's going to be a girl that looks just like that hanging out somewhere around the Hardee's. But I've been to Hardee's and there's nobody that looks like that at Hardee's. I'm telling you, we fall for anything. We don't stand for something, we'll fall for anything. What is the need? What is the want? Chuck Swindoll, who has a radio show, he's a pastor from California, and he was the president for many years, I don't know if he still is or not, of Dallas Theological Seminary. And he was talking to a, a student on the campus one day about that student's future, and he asked the student, kind of off the cuff, he said, where are you headed? Thinking, you know, what are your goals in life? And the student's reply was, lunch. <laughs> we so often trade our long-term goals for nearsighted desires. But you see, it's a matter of priorities. Some of you, and I'm glad you are, some of you are in Financial Peace University. You're learning to distinguish between a want and a need, deferring immediate wants for the good of the long-term goals. That's good. Esau believed the desire for the stew was the most important thing in life. In verse 32 it says this. It says, I'm about to die of what use is a birthright to me. Now, was he about to die? Was that a little bit of an exaggeration? The truth is, is that we've all done the same thing. We've all exaggerated our circumstances to the point that we're willing to do anything to change our circumstances. In this case, his desire for food overwhelmed any other desire in his life. And as a result, it was a bad mistake. We need to learn to distinguish between wants and needs. Lesson four. It's easy to go after the right things for the wrong reasons and in the wrong way. You see, there was nothing wrong with Esau wanting stew for dinner. I'm sure he walked into the, to the house or to the tent or wherever they live, and he smelled the stew cooking. You've all done that. You walk in and you say, hmm, I'm going to have some of that. That's good. Nothing wrong with that. But there was something wrong with his willingness to trade his birthright for it. So what this speaks to is our motivation for the things that we do, and especially the motivation for the things that we do for God. <clears throat> Stick with me. Esau fully understood the significance of his birthright. This was not a casual thing. He knew what it meant. He knew that he was a descendant from the father of the great nation that God was going to make out of his great-great-grandfather, Abraham. But his willingness to trade his birthright indicates his motivation or lack of motivation, as the case may be, for doing God's will. In verse 34, it clearly indicates his attitude. It says, Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate it and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Think about that for a minute. He despised his birthright. How might we, as Christians today, sell our birthright? 
One way we can do it is giving in to temporary pleasures of sin. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26 says this, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater, the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. See, folks, a lot of times we give in to a temporary pleasure that is sinful in exchange for the thing that God has called us to do. Another way we can do it is by lusting for the things of the world. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, here it is, the love of the Father is not in him. This is exactly what happened with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler came to Jesus by night. I believe that he was sincerely seeking the truth. And Jesus told him what he needed to do. And he said, I've done all of those things since my birth. And Jesus said, well, there's, there's one more thing you need to do. You need to sell everything you have. You need to give the money to the poor. You need to take up your cross and follow me. And the Bible doesn't testify that he did that. It says he went away very sad because he had great wealth. The reality is, is that we covet the things of this world more than we covet the things of God. And when we get that out of, out of balance, then this is the kind of, of circumstance or situation that results from that. Lusting for the things of the world. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterous people, do, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What is the answer? The answer is, we've got to think about what, what does God think, not what does the world think. Another way that we can, that we can trade our, our birthright is by walking after the flesh rather than after the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16-26 says this, but, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Here they are. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, compare that to the list I just gave you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he says against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So you need to ask yourself this question. What is it that I'm living for? If I'm living for a life that that is filled with, with feeling good, then I'm probably going to miss God's purpose for my life. I'm, I'm selling my spiritual birthright for a bowl of stew. You see, listen, folks, we only get one shot at this thing called life. We need to make sure that we're not wasting our lives by running after the wrong thing, by running in the wrong race. If you're living for what meets your immediate needs, just using God for what He can do for you, oh yeah, and a lot of people do that, you know, we'll hang out with God as long as we get what we ask Him for, but when He stops giving us what we ask for, then we got nothing to do with Him. You're going to end up losing your spiritual blessings. And these things count for eternity. 
The things of this world are here today and gone tomorrow. You're trading your soul for the wrong things. But if you live to further God's kingdom and God's purpose on this earth of blessing all nations through the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will be eternally blessed because you will have chosen the right thing. I've said this before, and I will say it again, that every time we come to a crossroads where we're tempted to go away from what God teaches and tells us is the right thing or the right way, we call that temptation. But every time we're tempted, that is an opportunity, listen, that is an opportunity to make the right choice. Oftentimes we say, you know, I didn't have a choice. You know, the enemy just got a hold of my mind and I just went for it. No, every, every time that we fail, it's because we made the wrong choice. Or we fail to make a choice at all. But if we choose to do what is right, if we choose to do what is good, if we choose to follow after the will of God for our lives, then we will discover that, that, that the things that we do here on earth will not only have an impact on the lives of other people here on earth, but they will also have an impact for eternity. How many of you know the name of Billy Graham's Sunday school teacher? don't know his name, do you? Sunday school teacher is the one that shared Christ with Billy Graham. One person shared Christ and Billy Graham accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And his life has been a life lived in bringing others to Christ. How many thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people have been affected by his teachings and brought to the saving knowledge of Christ. Because one Sunday school teacher was faithful in doing what God had called him to do. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have come to know Christ. And who knows out of those hundreds of thousands how many others have gone on to proclaim the gospel and to share the love of Christ. And we could count those people exponentially probably into the millions because one Sunday school teacher was faithful to, to do what God had called him to do, in teaching the Word of God to a small child. Folks, you don't know yet what God can do with you when you're willing to surrender your life to Him instead of selling your life for temporary pleasure. So the question is, do you want to trade? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you. With one